started broadcasting and something has to be said. Otherwise people will leave the broadcast. Last time we had over 1,200 people watching worldwide and we really tonight. So I'd like to welcome you to Rev Ginsburg's monthly English class, which is apparently being held every time in a different place in Yerushalayim. I hope that next month we'll be back to Netzach Israel, the uh, show that we were at on Ibn Ezra and Ramban. Um, just to remind you that every month we have a special on one of the books, uh, one of the English books. I have no idea what the special is this month. Nobody bothered to tell me. So uh, I guess we'll just have to wait in anxious anticipation to hear uh, what's on sale. Oh, and we have our regular host here, which allows me to go back to my comfortable seat. Where do you go? <laughs> Rabbi Avram Ari Trugman. Is he close? He's close. What? What did you say, sir? I don't know. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Welcome, everyone. In Yerushalayim, you're a Kodesh, and people all over the world. We're waiting for the Rav. We'll be here any minute. Ten dollars. Okay. Okay. I just found out the book of the month. Here's a book of the month called The Wandering Jew. This is a compilation of tweets from the Rav. It is the sweetest book in the world. Short and sweet and profound. This is the book of the month. Everyone can get it on inner.org in the bookstore. The Wandering Jew. It's really, it's really a great, great book. Also, I've been asked to announce a couple of Rafur Shlemas that we can have in mind for the learning tonight. Shlomo Yitzchak Ben Esther Fega Schwartz. For those who are in Los Angeles, Everyone knows Shlomo Schwartz, Schwartzy. He really needs a Rafur Shlema. Everyone should have him in mind for the learning tonight. And also Rezo Bat Chava should have a Rafur Shlema. And I'll take the opportunity because I have a feeling that uh, many people either here or around the world are aware that um, a very, very precious soul left the world this today. Um, the Kavura was just a few hours ago. Brucha uh, at bat chana yoel. Just went to the other world. And she should have an aliyat and neshama. Aliyat and neshama. While we're waiting for the Rav, I just want to say that today we know from the Altar Rebbe that we're supposed to live with the times. And today is a very, very special day in the Jewish calendar, especially the Chabad calendar. This is the beginning of Yud Shvat. And this is the Yurt site of the Friedeker Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, Rebbe Akodem, in nineteen fifty. He left this world on this day, Yud Shvat. And ever since, it's been a very, very important day in the Chabad calendar. Because exactly a year after the passing of the Friedeker Rebbe, the, 
the Rebbe became Rebbe on the same on the same day. And if anyone wants to see, there's actually a YouTube of the Rebbe giving his Maimar Hasidus Basi Lagani, which his father-in-law, the Friedrich Rebbe, had actually started, and he continued with this Maimar. And it's actually on YouTube, and the amazing, amazing thing talking about Yud Shvat. Mm -hmm. The amazing thing, if you didn't notice, the Rav is here, <laughs> is that uh, in the room with the Rebbe, there were, there were no more than 20 or 30 people. You can see it on, on, on YouTube. And it was on that day the Rebbe became Rebbe. And 40 years later, they're literally all over the world. There's Chabad everywhere. And that first Mimer of Hasidus, there were like 30 people there. Absolutely incredible. But it was really the Friedrich Rebbe that paved the way, all of the Mosdot, all of the foundations that the Rebbe built was really in the merit of the Friedrich Rebbe. And everyone knows that the Rebbe went to the kever of the Friedrich Rebbe every single week for decades every week and spend hours and hours there. The, the, the Kesher between them was, was so strong. Anyways, without further ado, um, the monthly English year with Rav Ginsburg. Good evening here in Israel and good morning and afternoon in, in America. As we just now heard, here in Israel we've entered our, already the, uh, the tenth day of Shvat, which is the outside the Hilul of the previous Rabbi of Chabad, and, uh, and thereby the beginning of the Nesiyut, of the the uh, last Rebbe. In every generation there is a figure who is the Rebbe of the generation, just like Moshe Rabbeinu, who taught in the Zohar that it Pashtuta de Moshe Bukhodara Vedara, the, the soul of Moses spreads and appears, returns and appears in every generation. And as soon as one appearance of Moshe, of Moshe Rabbeinu ascends and leaves us, so immediately that very moment, that same moment, the new appearance, the Male Makom, the, the successor to the to the Rebbe appears and continues to lead the generation towards, towards redemption and Mashiach. We're taught that that leader, that Moses of every generation actually is the potential 
Mashiach, the potential Messiah of the generation. And as soon as the generation merits, as soon as the time is absolutely ripe, that we cannot uh, foretell ourselves, but God knows, and we have to do our utmost to be, to be ready and uh, worthy of the revelation of the of the Rebbe of the generation as the Mashiach, not only of our generation, but of, for all time, for all history. So with this in mind, we thought that the most appropriate uh, topic to discuss this evening is the very idea and concept of of the Mashiach of the generation. And to, to contemplate as much as we can the different properties that uh, together form in our consciousness a picture of what we would expect, what we do expect the Mashiach to be. And as always, we, the model that we uh, use in all of our meditations is the model of the Sfirot, of the divine lights and channels of energy through which Hashem, God, creates the world. As those lights and channels manifest and reflect in our own souls, because each soul has its ten Sfirot, its ten powers and ten lights to it, and each one has a characteristic of its own. They all bl obviously blend together and form one, one personality. So, hoping that every one of us uh, has some familiarity with the, with the Sfirot, the names of the Sfirot and how they unfold. So, we'll proceed to to discuss, to, to contemplate each sphere by itself and how that reflects itself in the ideal personality of the Mashiach as it appears in the Bible, as it appears in the, in the writings of, the, of our sages, the Torah Shabbat Peh, the written Torah, the oral Torah, and especially in, in the Kabbalah and Hasidut. The first level is the crown. The crown is the super-rational level of the soul. It has three super-rational heads to it, which in the Hasidic language are referred to as faith and pleasure or serenity and will, the power of will, all super-rational. Speaking of the crown in general, one of the words that's always used in the Kabbalah Hasidut, in Hebrew the word is hafla'a, hafla, which means wonder. To look at a person and to see an aura of wonder of this individual, this person, that sense of wonder crowns his soul and crowns his personality. Each one of the spherot that we're going to discuss now, we could say that the Mashiach that we're trying to picture in our mind today, and this is a meditation that we can pursue every day of our lives, praying for Mashiach to come and reveal himself, praying also to reveal the spark of Mashiach in each one of us. So in a little, little way, all of the things we're not going to discuss actually are in us. If we manifest and reveal them sufficiently in ourselves and we reach some uh, critical mass of enough people that are revealing these properties in themselves, then the, uh, the Mashiach himself, the, the full-fledged, Mashiach 
will appear. So the first property that we're now uh, picturing and trying to experience is wonder, a sense of wonder. That we have here a figure, a person, who is just the most wonderful and wondrous person I can imagine. What more can we say about wonder? As we said before, the, the Rebbe is the Mashiach of the generation. A Chosid, in relation to his Rebbe, feels that on the one hand, the Rebbe is the farthest person away from me imaginable. And simultaneously, he's the very closest person to me in the world. There's no one so removed, so distant, so distant from me as this wondrous individual. At the same time, there's no one that is so close to me and that I identify with as much as this wondrous individual. That itself is the greatest wonder. How can it be far and close simultaneously? Every Jewish soul, and especially the, the soul of the Mashiach, more than all, reflect divine properties. We all have a divine soul. And one of the things about the divine, about God, is that he is both transcendent and imminent simultaneously. So as much as a human being can emulate God, that person who is at one at the same time transcendent and also imminent, which are just two other words for saying far away and very, very close at the same time, that's the, the ultimate revelation of that is the Mashiach. And that's the wonder, because true wonder is a paradox. It's two opposites that exist simultaneously. And the two opposites are tra transcendence, the infinitely above and beyond what I can fathom. And at the same time, he's my closest relative. I have no one who's closer to me than my father that my mother, father and mother are the two coming, the two next spirit in the tree of life, wisdom and understanding. But there's something about the crown that is even closer, a closer relative to me even than my father and my mother. Can we say anything more about the, the wonder of this uh, person? Mashiach. If we turn to, to Chazal, to the sages, based upon a verse in Isaiah, the sages say that the Mashiach had a very special property, and actually it's so, it's so uh, essential with regard to the Mashiach that it's the way that we know to identify who is the Mashiach, and that property is called Morach Vedayim that he judges by smell. As the verse says, not by sight and not by hearing does he judge. He judges by smell, it means that he has some once more super rational sensitivity to the other individual, to the two individuals that are coming to be judged before him. And he just by, as it were, this is an, an idiom of course, by smell, without having to look at them, without having to hear what they have to say, he, he, he recognizes and identifies the truth and judges them. So the Chazal say that if an individual appears and he is able to judge by smell, that's the sign that he must be the Mashiach.
In Kabbalah, the different senses that we possess, that every human being possesses, also correspond to the different spherot. The sense of smell is the sense that corresponds to the crown. Sight is wisdom, the next one. Hearing is understanding, the next one, the following sphira. But the highest sphira, which is the crown, the super rational level of the soul and of all of the channels of creation, relates to the sense of smell. So it's clear that this, uh, this property that we're taught that the Mashiach possesses is a keter, a crown property, which means that it's a, a sense of it radiates to us, projects to us this sense of wonder, which is actually the crown of the Mashiach. And obviously it's uh, clear uh, that's the, exactly the way Chazal presented, that this is the most wondrous thing that a human being can, uh, can express, that he's able to judge, to relate, and to, once more to, to feel just by smell. So to conclude the Keter, Keter is the sense of wonder of this soul that appears to us. The next three go together, they're called Chabad. Chabad is Chokhmah, Bina and Dat, wisdom, understanding and knowledge. So they have something in common, they're all intellectual properties, but each one is, has something individual about itself. And uh, obviously we could say that the, uh, that the Mashiach must be the wisest soul on earth. He must be the most understanding soul on earth. He must be, he must be the most knowledgeable soul on earth. But we have to try to uh, not to contemplate, understand that a little bit better, what that means, the wisest person in the world, the most understanding, the most knowledgeable. To be wise is to possess a very deep sense of insight into reality, into other people. To be wise is to be ingenious, to be able to see the source of a given problem and to know how to solve it. A problem solver, a very ingenious person, a very insightful soul. These are properties that pertain to, to wisdom and these are properties that we would expect to appear and to exist in the in our ideal person that we're now trying to outline, to picture. A good doctor must know, know how first to diagnose the, the situation of the patient. Sometimes a person has a problem, you can go to many doctors, like good doctors, but they don't know how to, they don't find the problem. As soon as you find the problem, that itself is half of the remedy. In Kabbalah, wisdom is called the beginning of revelation. It's compared to a flash of lightning on the pain of the consciousness. A person is wise, there's another word, a simple word in English that you call a wise person, bright. A bright guy, a bright person. So once more I would expect that the Mashiach would be the brightest person on earth. To be bright means that you have your flashlight in your soul and you can immediately shine it on what needs to be revealed, 
on small rooms. The question is a is an ailment, so you can shine it on the source of the ailment. As soon as it's illuminated, then it's already, as we said before, it's called half of the remedy. It's half healed. The other half of healing will reach in the continuation. So once more, the Mashiach must be someone who has the property of illumination. He can illuminate re reality. What's the next one? The next few is called understanding, Bina. If I say that someone understands me, people search for a soulmate to get married. What would you like to, to have in your soulmate? The first thing I would, would very much uh, des desire is that he or she understands me. What does it mean to, to understand me? There's another word which is called to contain me. In Hebrew it's called hachalal hachiloti. To understand another individual is actually a mother concept because understanding is called the mother in Kabbalah. Wisdom is called the father. The father is the source of insight, of light. He's the bright soul, the ultimate bright soul. But the mother who embraces her children, first she embraces the children in her womb, and then she embraces the whole family, and she embraces her husband as well. In the home, the woman herself is called the home. The mother is the home. And the home is a context of containment. What's more to understand is to contain. One thing about the Mashiach, it says that the word Mashiach is a permutation of two different forms of the word to be happy. Either Yisma, which means that he shall be happy, or Yisma, which means that he shall make happy, that he makes other people happy. In Kabbalah and Chassidot, the power to contain others, to reach out, and embrace other souls, which is not just physically, once more to understand the other soul, is dependent upon a certain sense, uh, an inner sense of joy. And joy contains, when a person is joyful, all of the guests, like at a wedding, so he is just so happy to embrace and contain and actually understand everyone where he is, where, where he's at. Another way to say uh, containment and understanding is to say that the Mashiach, the figure that we're now trying to outline, is someone who takes me for what I am and then he accepts me as I am. But you can't be understanding and uh, very critical at the same time. To be understanding and to be joyful and to embrace me in joy is because you accept me as I am. The father figure wants to correct me the father wants to correct the children. So he has to have the power to, to shine his flashlight, his light on the problem in order to solve the problem. But the mother 
accepts the family, each family member as he is. And both properties are necessary. The property to illuminate the problem and the property to simply to, to understand. It's more to understand someone. If I really understand you, I must accept you as you are. It doesn't mean that I don't want you to improve. There's something about the mother principle also in Kabbalah that mother has to do with improvement, with continual improvement. But that improvement begins and depends upon my first accepting you as you are, which is understanding you, where you're at. The next property of the soul is Da'at, knowledge. So it's just like uh, the Mashiach that we're trying to contemplate is the most wise and insightful. There's another word that we didn't use before in English, creative. Wisdom is also creativity. Ingenious is like creative, the most ingenious soul. And he's also the most understanding soul. So he's the most knowledgeable soul, not knowledgeable to us just in the sense that he knows a lot of items. Mashiach is not just a giant supercomputer that knows everything. He knows what a computer cannot know. What can a computer not know? He cannot know you. Knowledge in Hebrew means to connect two souls that connect together. Before we mention the concept of marriage, in Hebrew, the actual act of marital union is called knowledge. As it appears in the beginning of the Torah in Genesis that Adam knew his wife Eve. Knowledge is empathy. It's the origin, the basis of the, uh, the that state of of, uh, of being that is necessary in order to have true compassion on another individual. To know you is to project myself into you and to receive you into myself. It's not just to embrace you. They're close. The sages say that that knowledge and understanding are interdependent, but each one has its own character to it. What's more understanding is to contain but the knowledge is to know you. What's more, to know you is to unite with you, to connect with you. If I, if I said before that to understand you means to take you, to accept you as you are, ultimately in a sense, in a state of joy. To know you is to connect to you from where I am to where you are. And that connection can be so strong and potent that it can bear fruit, can bear children. If I really connect with you, we unite just like in a marital union and the result is offspring. So just try to imagine a soul, as well as the soul of Mashiach, that knows each one of us. All of many of these properties that we're now trying to, uh, to feel, to experience, those that were very close to the Rebbe felt these uh, properties. The Rebbe knows me. It's not just that he contains me. Each one is important. 
that he illuminates me, he contains me. But to know me is something more. Once more, to know me is to impregnate me with himself, to put a piece of himself into me. He has the ability to inject a little drop of himself into my heart and thereby I become pregnant with his presence in myself. Rabbi Nachman used to say that, they, that when he told stories, he would impregnate the people that heard his stories. So once a true, a true tzaddik and ultimately the Mashiach, with his words, his teachings, his insights, he's not just teaching Torah, which is uh, theoretical. He's looking at you in the eyes, and what comes to his mouth is actually words that are intended to penetrate your heart. Because he knows you. First he knows you, who you are, and then he knows you in the act of union. So once more, he's the most knowledgeable, knowing soul on earth. Obviously, he also knows a lot of people. The Rebbe knew thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people individually and remembered everything about them. So he, he had a, a what, probably a superhuman mind. But how did he know the people? Because he really was concerned about the people. That's why knowledge is the basis of, knowledge is empathy. So we would expect that the Mashiach will know all of us, know all of us individually, as much as a human soul will come to, to explain that a human soul must be limited, but the Mashiach is not God, he's not infinite, but to the extent of his limitations as a human being, he still goes way far and beyond any uh, human achievement to date. Especially in this sense, ability to know many, many souls. About Moses, that's what the Mashiach is the ultimate Moses. It says that he knew all of the 600,000 600, souls of Israel, the soul roots. He was able to sing the individual song of each of the souls of Israel. To sing your song is, is the ultimate expression of knowing you. Every soul has its song. So the Mashiach is a, also a super musician, that he knows the song, the melody of every soul, and he sings to that soul his song, his individual song. So these were the three faculties of the mind. Now we turn to the, to the heart. The three primary emotions of the heart are called loving kindness and might and beauty in Hebrew chesed, vuran, tiferet. They correspond to the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The first is the most straightforward, that the Mashiach must be the most loving soul on earth. He loves all of us. The previous three faculties, once more, they all have something very deep. They do have intellectual power to them. This is just pure emotion, simple, pure love. 
Does love do something besides just loving you? Obviously, if he has the ability, the possibility, because he loves you, he'll give to you whatever, you, whatever he, ha he has to give you. But just the, the energy power of loving another soul, what does that energy produce? What does that do? So before we were talking about wisdom, in the tree of life, loving kindness is the sfira that appears just under wisdom on the right axis of the, of the tree of life. One half of healing an ailment of the soul is by shining light at it. That's wisdom. And we said that that's half of the remedy. What is the other half of the remedy? The other half of the remedy is simply the power of love. Love heals. How do I know that love heals? Because this is what we're taught about Abraham. One of the properties of Abraham is that he was the first soul on earth that had the power to heal by loving and praying. By his love for all humanity, even people that weren't so nice to him. Avi Melech, the king of the Plishtim at that time. He wasn't good to him, but nonetheless, when he was ill and sick, and the whole kingdom became ill and sick, because he took Sarah. At the end, when he returned Sarah, Abraham, once more, will symbolize the epitome of love, prayed for him. It's the first time in the Torah that the word to heal appears. That God healed Abimelech and his whole household because of Abraham. So once more, love is the power to heal. Messiah comes to heal humanity, all of the ills of humanity. The physical ills and the spiritual ills. And he does it through his power of Abraham. His power of love. The next power of the soul, the attribute of the heart, is might, Vura. Another word, and a synonym for might in English, which is the most appropriate to try now to picture the ultimate ideal soul, the ideal Rebbe, the Mashiach. So the word is courage, courageous. Everything up to now was just very nice uh, ideas. Now we're already getting to uh, some a word that, that, that means uh, strength, strength of character. But courage, when do you have to be courageous? You have to be courageous if there's some opposing power that's, <clears throat> that's fighting against you and you have to overcome it. When Mashiach comes, there still will be opposition in the world. And the Mashiach will still have to be uh, in battle until he succeeds in, in killing the evil serpent responsible for the primordial sin of man, of mankind. And that uh, serpent will manifest in all a, a myriad of ways in society. So the Mashiach will obviously have to be the most courageous soul on earth to, to overcome his enemies. This is a very, very simple uh, 
simple thing that the Rambam, my Madhudi, says that the Mashiach, when he appears, the first thing he'll do is he'll heal the ills of the Jewish people, which means arouse and inspire the Jewish people to return to God and to the way of the Torah. The second thing you'll have to do is uh, is fight and be victorious over Amalek, the arch enemy of the Jewish people, the arch enemy of good in the world. And that he does with his power, with his courage, with his might that he possesses. So the Mashiach will have to be the most courageous person. And if you see a person that's very, very courageous, so that's very for good things, so that must be a spark, a, messi a messianic spark. The next one is beauty. Mashiach must be the most beautiful soul. What does it mean to be beautiful? It's not just handsome, physical beauty. He will be beautiful, but that's not the essence of beauty, what beauty means. Beauty is the ability to integrate all of the positive elements that are not the same, not always uniform, but to integrate and to blend together all good hues and colors, thereby creating the most beautiful array and uh, ensemble, but talk before of music, of, of sounds and hues all blending together in the most beautiful whole. There's an explicit verse that refers to the beauty of the Mashiach. It says, The king, referring to King Messiah, the king, in his beauty shall your eyes see. Meaning that the prophet says that we're all praying and, and waiting and aspiring to be able to envision, to see the beauty of the king. The beauty of the king is what inspires us. In Kabbalah, beauty reaches all the way up to the crown, to the super-rational crown, which is the wonder of Mashiach. When the wonder appears as beauty, it is the source of inspiration, inspires all of us to be like him. Beauty attracts, people are drawn to beauty, and beauty inspires to emulate. Just like we said before that the Mashiach emulates God in the crown, in Tiferet, in beauty, the Mashiach arouses in us a tremendous desire to emulate him. So once more, a person that you see and you, I, you say, I, I would be, would love, to just be a little bit like this soul, this great soul. That is the beauty of the soul. Another thing about beauty is that Tiferet in Kabbalah has to do with, with the Torah in general and teaching the Torah in particular. One thing that the sages say about Mashiach and the Maimonides also explains about Mashiach that he will be the greatest teacher of all times. The ultimate teacher. That property being the ultimate teacher of humanity, where does that belong to in the tree of the Sfirot? That belongs to this Sfirah of Tiferet, of beauty. When we say and we wish 
ourselves that the king appears in his beauty, that our eyes merit to see the beauty of the king. In what context in particular does that uh, pertain to? The context in which we see the beauty of the king is when the king addresses and speaks and teaches, especially teaches the people. Well, this is something that that uh, that merited to be to to hear and to see the the rabbi or a great tzaddik teach. In his teaching, that's when all of his beauty appears. That's because once mortiferet beauty is the the middle pillar and axis of the tree of life. That's where the Torah is, and since it's in the middle, it, it, it blends together all of the hues and, and the tones, as we said before. And the beauty is especially when he teaches Torah. Can we say something more about beauty? We said before, Mashiach is not God. All of us have a, have a uh, godly spark in ourselves. What we can say about the Mashiach is that the Mashiach, in a certain way, to use the term from uh, biology, from evolution theory, the Mashiach is definitely, in a certain way, a new positive mutation of mankind. It is like a quantum leap of humanity to a new place. Almost to say that a new species of mankind is appearing on the scene of, the, of reality. How does uh, evolutionary theory uh, explain positive mutations? Positive mutations are mutations which are beautiful. What does it mean that they're beautiful? It means that they attract mating. A positive mutation is so beautiful that the other sex wants to, to marry it. That's the sign of the positive mutation, and to, to, to bear offspring. <coughs> so this is a way to imagine the Mashiach. Mashiach is that positive mutation that all of mankind is going to fall in love with. He says, so beautiful, and want to unite with him, and to have ch ch children from him, to be like him. And so all of these properties are properties of beauty, of Tiferet. The next two properties of the soul, of the heart, are a pair. They always appear as a pair. In Hebrew, the Netzach and Hod, which is usually translated as victory and acknowledgement. But there are those emotive properties of the soul that appear in action. The previous three emotions are simply emotions of the heart, per se. But when a person now begins to actually take action, so he also has to have different um, motivations, emotive motivations. And the primary are these two that always work together like two legs that can't walk one without the other. And they're called netzach and hod, victory and acknowledgement. Some people 
like to to uh, picture the Mashiach as once more we just now said that he's like a new mutation of humanity but together with that he's not just simply a superman before we said he's not God now we're saying that he's also not superman <coughs> the Mashiach what do I mean by that that the Mashiach, however great he is, he does not rely on miracles. The Mashiach himself, his crown, his wonder, that he himself is like a miracle, a walking miracle, a walking wonder. But in his work, in rectifying the world, bringing redemption to the world, building the base of Mikdash, which is the most beautiful thing on earth, that the three things that the Rambam outlines that Mashiach does, first he, he heals ourselves and then he fights and is victorious over Amalek and then he builds the base of Mikdash, the temple in Jerusalem. All those three are the three first emotive properties that we said before. But you might think that the Mashiach relies on miracles. And for he himself is a miracle, a superman. No. The Mashiach, together with how great he is and how wondrous he is and all the properties that we discussed up until now, at the very same time, the Mashiach is the most practical soul on earth. He's the most industrious person there is, as we witnessed in the Rebbe. The Mashiach is a hard worker. Some people would like to see the Mashiach as a super, we'll use another term, not, not as a superman, as a magician. The Mashiach is not a magician. He, he doesn't do things by magic. If you're a magician, you don't have to work hard. You just do things by magic. That's not Mashiach. Mashiach is a hard worker. He gets up early and he goes to work and he goes to sleep late and he's working hard all day long. What are the two sides of a hard worker? The two words we use before in English, he's industrious and he's diligent. To be industrious is to use all of the potential that he has. The Mashiach recognizes his own limitations and the limitations of society that he has come to to help. Recognizing his own limitations and doing his utmost to overcome obstacles to the maximum extent that he is able to due to his limitations. That's Netzach. That's victory. Recognizing, and once more, that's being as industrious as he possibly can be. Recognize the limitations that society as it existed at present places upon him. And coping with those limitations, that's the Sfirah of Hod, of acknowledgement and thanksgiving. So once more, you might expect that Mashiach be, be, a, be a mortal individual. According to the Ramam, he's not immortal. Resurrection is a, is a further stage in the development of, of the world in redemption. According to Maimonides, the simple charge is that Mashiach is mortal. 
he lives and he dies. He, his legacy remains eternally. And the world that he corrects is corrected eternally. But he's a mortal individual. He's also a fallible individual. He's not totally infallible. That's why he's not God, he's not a superman, and he's not a magician. And the fact that it's very, very practical are these two spherols of, uh, of Netzach and Hod. After these two comes Yesod, foundation. Foundation in the heart is very similar to Da, to knowledge in the mind because it's a power of connection. But the property of Yesod in relation to our, to our ultimate ideal individual is that Yesod is the property of loyalty. It's both loyalty, just like loyalty to one's spouse, and it's both devotion, devotion to one's cause and purpose. And devotion, obviously, the cause and purpose of the Mashiach is, the, is to redeem mankind. So he is, just as he's a very, very practical, and industrious, and diligent, those words that we used before, when it comes to Yesod, so it becomes the, the epitome of devotion to the cause and loyalty in knowledge he knew each one of us. In Yesod, he's not going to let any one of us down. Because he's loyal to each and every one of us. So you can be reassured that the Mashiach is not going to let you down. That reassurance is a property, or is recognizing in the Mashiach the property of his soul, his foundation that he possesses. The last of the Sirot is Mahut, kingdom. Obviously, Mashiach is a kingdom. He's the king, King Messiah. But what does that mean in our picturing of the person of Mashiach? Kingdom is is his affinity and similarity to King David. And the most essential property of King David that he was lowly. Vaiti Shafal Bain, I am very lowly in my own eyes. Malchut, kingdom, the last of the Sphero to reflect the very first the crown, because the crown is for a king. In Crown, we said that there's a, a, a paradox that is revealed, the paradox of simultaneous transcendence and imminence. That's what produces the sense of wonder. In Kingdom, the king is most charismatic. To be a king, you have to be a leader that's a charismatic leader. I might think that uh, charisma is actually a property of beauty. In Kabbalah, beauty does connect to kingdom, but there's some special charisma in kingdom which is not simply, which is not even all of those properties of beauty that we mentioned before. And that's the charisma that comes with existential lowliness. There are two verses in Proverbs. One says that the, the woman of grace supports glory, and the second says that the, that the lowly of spirit supports 
lowly. And from these two verses we see that the, the lowly of spirit is himself the woman of grace. That's why the charisma of, of Mahut of kingdom is called Chain, grace. The beauty of Tiferet is Pe'er, or Yofi, Melech Piyofyo in Hebrew. There are different synonyms for beauty. The beauty that we discussed before in Tiferet is either Yofi or Pe'er. But the beauty of Mahut is the beauty of Chen, of grace, of finding grace. And the Torah teaches us that the true holy grace comes with a sense of lowliness. What is the paradox that appears in Malchut, similar to the paradox of, of the crown? On the one hand, the king in his lowliness is transparent. What do I mean by transparent? That he reveals through himself that the kingdom is not mine, but the kingdom is his. There's a commandment in the Torah to appoint a king, that we, the Jewish people, appoint a king. That commandment reads, place you shall place upon yourself a king. Why does it say place you shall place twice? So the Zohar says that the first place means first place God is the king. And then place a, a human being, the Mashiach is the king. At first God has to be the king. And that human being who is the one worthy to be a king is the one who knows more than anyone else in the world that, on, that only God is the king. And he's totally transparent to that truth and to that realization. So the true king is the one who is just not there as a king. Through him, God reigns forever and ever. He said that he's not immortal, but since he's transparent to the kingdom of, of God, God reigns through him the Ulam Ba'ed forever and ever. At the same time, it says about Mahut, its inner essence is transparent to God because of his lowliness. Lowliness also obviously means humility and modesty. At the same time, the Mahut kingdom is called a mirror. When you look into a mirror, you see yourself reflected in the mirror. So that a true king is one that everyone looks at, actually sees his own reflection in the king. One of the souls in the Tanakh and the Bible that represents kingdom is Queen Esther, the heroist of the holiday of Purim that we're approaching. It says about her, about Esther, <coughs> Esther Amaka, that it wasn't, she concealed her identity. No one knew what nation she was from. Everyone that looked at her saw her as a member of his nation. Meaning that actually everyone that looked at her saw himself. This is a property of a king, of a true king, that everyone actually sees himself in the king. The king is just a mirror. So he has these two properties of pain, which are actually two different, even opposing, opposite properties, simultaneous. And on one hand, he's transparent to God. On the other hand, he's a mirror that each one and every one of us sees ourselves in him, and that's his grace. That's his ultimate charisma. That 
we all see ourselves reflected in his person. So now we have discussed in short the outline of the character of the picture of the Mashiach that we're all waiting for. May he appear speedily in our days. month, the wandering Jew. So look how much Hashkacha, divine providence there is, is that the Rav began discussing Mashiach, the idea that he will be wondrous, a wondrous soul. So incredible Hashkacha. So this is the book of the month, um, but with the Rav's permission, uh, I have a purpose to telling this story, a very short story. Uh, the Rav said in, in the aspect of Netzah, the soul of the Mashiach, but also it means the spark of the Mashiach within us, works very hard. So it's a very, very short but important story that once Rabbi Chaim Vital says to the Ariza, he says, how did you merit to reach such spiritual heights? And so the Ariza said, I worked very hard. So Rabbi Chaim Vital, who is a genius of geniuses, and is way up there himself, in wonder said to the Ariza, I also work very hard. And the Ariza looked at him and said, but I worked harder. And the reason I thought to tell that story is that the Rav also said that this idea of the Mashiach is not a magician. So, I just want to let everyone know, Rabbi Ginsberg did not write over a hundred books without a lot of hard work. It was not magic. It was a lot of hard work. And I know for the people here right outside are many of the Rav's books. For those who are watching around the world, you can go to inner.org. And if you don't have the Rav's books, you are missing something very, very, very important. Obviously, if you're listening to me, means that you are very connected to the teachings of the Rav. But there are over a hundred books out there that need to be read and studied and given over to other people. So this is an invitation for everyone to start to complete their library of Rabbi Ginsburg's books. Okay, now we'll start with the questions. This is from, oh, it doesn't say from who or from where. It says, should we need to deal with discovering the Mashiach the actual person? If yes, it, do we need, does it need to be someone from this generation or the past generation? We can obviously understand what this person is asking. In the Talmud we find that the sages say that if the Mashiach is from the living, he resembles such and such. And if he's from the from the dead, he also resembles such and such. And such and such from the dead is the prophets or the 
the great uh, Daniel, figure of Daniel, and the prophet, the person, the potential Mashiach from the present is Rabbi, Rabbi Noah Kadosh. That's what it says in Talmud. Meaning that, it, that the sages leave it open. Obviously, we're looking for someone that, uh, that is alive in, in this generation. So, uh, so we have to keep looking hard. <laughs> With hard work, if we look for him, we'll find him. <laughs> this is from Leah in Sfat. Uh, could the Rav please talk more about courage? The popular teaching is, quote, Feel the fear and do it anyway. How do we tap into the courage that is in potential in each one of us? Well, the courage is usually the ability to go against the trend, to, to swim against the current, to think out of the box. All of these uh, idioms and symbols require courage, to be able to differ for the sake of, of God, of the truth, to get up and say the truth as you understand the truth to be. We learn Torah in order to give us courage. One of the reasons that we learn study deeply and work hard at studying the Torah is to give courage, because the Torah is in order to teach us the truth, and the truth is usually not what, you, what is held as common, common in the knowledge and common uh, the agenda of the of the uh, populace at, at large, and a person that speaks the truth has to have a lot of courage. So the the essence of the courage of Mashiach is actually speaking the truth. The the Mashiach is the leader. The word leader in Hebrew means actually speaker. The Mashiach is the ultimate leader, means it's the ultimate speaker of the generation. And to speak the truth is not always to say what is politically correct. So that's the very simple meaning of courage, to have the courage to say and to lead, not just to say, but actually to lead people towards the truth the truth is the, is the end that we're, we want to reach. And it's not always the politically correct thing to do and to say, and for that you have to have a lot of courage. So just think about it, and, and I, I wish that we all, uh, we all have that necessary courage to do it, as the Rebbe would say, but often, even though you're saying things which are not commonly accepted and politically correct, but the Rebbe would always say, but often Hamid Kabel. Nonetheless, in the nicest possible way that does find favor in the eyes and the ears of the public. Okay. This question is from someone in Yerushalayim. Uh, could the Rav talk more about the idea which the Rav has given over before that the Mashiach will be someone that you would least expect. This idea, despite the fact that we just went through a whole <laughs> 10 so. aspects of what we could expect from the Mashiach, there's also a complementary teaching that the Mashiach will be so wondrous. Right. Yeah. So now you just answered the question. <laughs> The answer to the question is the is the keter. It's all the things that we expect, and we can actually a little bit try to define are the properties from wisdom down. But the keter, which is the true wonder, is going to be a surprise. And this is the the question is a very very appropriate good question that was asked now. In fact. I even thought that we would begin the class with this question, that uh, the Alter Rebbe, the first Rebbe of Chabad, would say that the, that Mashiach that everyone is expecting is never going to come, and the true Mashiach that nobody really expects is going to be a total surprise. 
So that's a pro that is the property of the crown. And that's, that itself is the wonder. Okay, this is from Abraham in Los Angeles. So in the Shi'ur, the Rav mentioned that the Mashiach will have to do battle and defeat the primordial snake. So the question is, how does this primordial snake manifest itself in society today? And how will the Amalek of our generation be overcome? And who, what exactly is Amalek? Okay, so we, we have answered this question before, because we said that the, uh, the courage of the Mashiach is to be able to get up and say things which are not politically correct, that's the phrase that we used. Meaning that the quote-unquote politically correct, that itself is Amalek, that's the enemy. Where does that express itself? That expresses itself in, in the media of the generation. The primordial snake is the essence, or he who is in control of the media right now. The controller of the internet and of all media and all of news, that is the primordial snake. Now, if the primordial snake does tshuva, he can also do tshuva. <laughs> then he becomes a great that says that he would, had him not have sinned, the primordial snake would have become the great servant of humanity. So he has the potential, he still has the potential to become the great servant of humanity. But that's, that's what has to, that's what we have to have the courage to, to, to fight in a, in a way that we have to be ingenious. It's, more, we have to be wise. To fight, you have to be wise. In Kabbalah, we're taught that the origin of Gvura, of might, is in wisdom. So the question here was asked, how do we do it? In order to do it right and, and that it should work, besides being industrious and hardworking, we have to be ingenious. So let's uh, once more pray to Hashem that He gives us that, uh, that wisdom, that ingenuity that is necessary in order to, to fight the primordial serpent. Okay, now we'll take some questions here from Yerushalayim. We'll try to get both sides of the mafitza here. <coughs> Excuse me. But before we do it, just in case um, anyone needs to leave or tune out, the next shiur is the 5th of March, which is the first Sunday of March, and it is Zion Adar. So I don't think we have to be prophets and prophetesses to wonder what the Shia might, might be about on Zion Adar. That is the birthday and the yurt site of Moshe Rabbeinu. So everyone stay tuned. And also there's a good, for those people here especially, there's a very good chance that the Shia will be here again, but it's not 100%. So everyone's been getting the WhatsApp and emails, so make sure that you check where it is. It could be here and it could not be here. Okay. Um, I'd like to know uh, what's the difference <coughs> saying uh, about Moshe Rabbeinu that he is the uh, Aral Sipatayim, and then in the translation for a link saying he's the human not. Okay, I want to repeat it for those people outside of this room. The question is, is that at one point, Moshe defines himself as being of uncircumcised lips, expressing that he can't speak. But the question was, that it seems that the uncleist, the Targum, is maybe explaining it a little bit different. And the question is to the Rav, if he could explain this. 
Well, the Yalkir Mamla is not a difference, just that's the aromatic way of saying that he, that his uh, lips are uncircumcised. Yalkir means heavy. He's heavy of speech. That's the literal translation of Unkulus. Yalkir means heavy. So, uh, Moses is so spiritual, is what we're taught, that he's more soul than body. Elijah is the opposite, that his body is refined to the utmost. It says that Moses was pregnant only for seven months. And Elijah was 12 months in pregnancy. So his body came out perfectly refined. Moses' soul was very powerful to the extent that the, the body was unable to accept it fully. So anything that was physical for Moses was heavy. So the reason that he couldn't to, to speak was to think you don't need to use your physical limbs. But to speak you need to use your physical body and the re that, for that very reason it was, it was hard for him to speak. Because is the soul did not totally penetrate the body and his lips, his speech was heavy. That's what Unculus tells us. Okay, question? Just to repeat the question, I hope I understood it correctly, is after going through 10 aspects of the soul, of the projected idea of Mashiach and the spark of Mashiach within each person, the question is, should a person try to activate or realize all 10 soul aspects or pick one or two that they're most natural to them and try to develop those and from there go to the others. Okay, certainly if you feel affinity to, to one of these uh, properties more than the others, you can definitely work, try to work and manifest that more. The, uh, a great principle in Kabbalah is that uh, rectification has to do with the balance. And for the, that reason of balance and equilibrium, the tree of life is, uh, is based upon three axes that we mentioned before, right, left, and middle. If the property that you choose is at the middle, is on the middle line, the middle axis of the zero, then definitely you can emphasize that by itself and then go on from one to the other. If the property that you feel closest to or want to uh, develop is on the right, you should simultaneously try to balance it by the property on the left. But if you have, if something is on the right, it should be balanced by the left. If something is in the middle initially, then that's okay by itself. Okay, a question from Noah. Not sure from where. Uh, the Rav mentioned from, from the Ark. <laughs> the, <comes from> the, <laughs> Ark. <laughs> the Rav mentioned that the Mashiach will not be lacking enemies, and especially in Rambam, one of the definitions of Mashiach is he will have to fight the final wars. So the question is, how will Mashiach fight? And with what weapons will he use? So this is an explicit verse in Isaiah that it says that Uvaruach Sfatav Mitrasha that he will fight with the spirit of his lips. So that actually has to do with the question that was asked before about Moses being 
being uh, uncircumcised have lips. The Mashiach will have to have very good lips because he fights and he kills the enemies and the, the serpent with the spirit of his lips. That's the, that's the verse in the Torah. Rabbi Nachman says it will not have to shoot one bullet. Just the spirit of his lips. Okay, the question is that uh, it seems that different aspects of spirituality um, in the world in general, meditation and mindfulness, um, the fascination with Kabbalah and Jewish meditation. And the question is, is this a passing fad or phase? Or is this actually a uh, forerunner of the Messianic era? So we definitely believe that this is a forerunner of the Messianic era. That just we have to get, get it right. And not go after yoga and similar things which are not, not from us. And not actually for anyone. Because ultimately the whole world will fall in love with the Torah and the beauty of the Mashiach and all spirituality is there it says that there are point, different points of wisdom that we can learn and incorporate from foreign sources but no spiritual way of life Chas Shalom. it's all in the Torah and we just have to be this is a beginning what we're experiencing now is a beginning beginning has to gain more and more momentum. So that's how the purpose, that's the reason we're here, to give this more momentum. And we used the phrase before that we, it has to reach some critical mass. And then as soon as it reaches the momentum, reaches the critical mass, and it will just snowball by itself. And Mashiach will, will be here. Again, hopefully I understood this correctly, but in short, the question is, many of the different aspects that the Rav talked about were very proactive, having a vision of where we want to end up as, as a people and as an individual. And then there are also aspects that are more receptive, trying to be in tune with Hashem's will. So what is the right balance in revealing the inner spark within ourselves and bringing Mashiach to the world between being proactive and more receptive. Okay, so that's exactly what we mentioned before, that there has to be the balance equilibrium between the right and the left. And the essential equilibrium is called the scales. And the scales in Kabbalah are the two sfirot, the two powers of Netzach and Hod. That you mentioned Netzach, that's just the proactivity. And hold is the receptivity. It says that some things we're able to initiate ourselves. Whatever a person can initiate and do, and this is what we meant by recognizing one's own limitations. You're limited, I'm limited, everyone is limited, Mashiach also is limited. There are certain elements that 
limitation to a certain extent can be overcome. We say this in short. That's a Netzach property, a victory property. That's called active trust. The two properties of Netzach and Hod that go together as a pair are called active trust and passive trust. The verse in the Bible is Batuchot Chokmah. They both have, it's called the wisdom of the kidneys. And that wisdom of the kidneys is called two forms of confidence. One is active confidence, means that I have confidence that Hashem gives me the power to get up and do things, to work hard and accomplish things. And when I, my limitations say to me, well, this I just can't do by myself at all, I must rely totally on God, on Hashem. So that's called passive confidence, and that's the Sfirah of that's acknowledgement and thanksgiving. The two souls that exemplify these two forms of, of, uh, of confidence are King David in his wars and the King Chizkiahu in his war against uh, Sanchiviv. The King David got up and pursued his enemies to the very end. He did it all himself. With the power of God, he was transparent. Mm -hmm. But he got up and he fought. He was totally active, with 100% active. And the very opposite was Chizkiel, that he recognized that he, he had no power to fight and to overcome uh, Sanchiviv, his enemy. What did he do? It says he went to sleep. And he just relied on God, that God will take care of him. And that's exactly what happened. Once more, he, he said, I can't do it. And he knew he was, he, he, he was true and sincere. Only God can do it. I'm just going to let God take over. So those are the two extremes. They have to work as partners. It's called Netzach and Hod. And once more, it's all the practicality, we said, to being practical. Sometimes practicality means that you're practical and you work hard and you do something. And sometimes to be practical is to just recognize that right now I can't do anything. That's the opposite extreme, meaning that only God can do. That's the bitachon pa'il, it's called active security, or confidence, and passive confidence. Okay, so I'm going to read the next two questions together. <clears throat> because they go together. The first one is from Robin in Los Angeles, asking the Rav if he could explain what it means in the Talmud that Mashiach is a bar nafla, and as it were, an aborted soul, or a soul that is in a, in, in a constant process of being aborted. And the next question is very important, lest anyone doubts that people all over the world are watching this. Um, this is from actually a good friend, John, in Abu Dhabi, who, the, the Rav actually answered this already, but I think he wants a deeper explanation, um, is will the Mashiach be immortal or will he die? Okay, we'll start from the from that from the end. We said definitely that according to the Rambam, he will not be immortal. He says that he will live and die. If we merit, it's a, a question of merit to the resurrection happening in the beginning of the appearance of Mashiach, then he will be immortal, and many other souls will also be immortal. And ultimately, all souls will be revived and come back to life. But the, the simple pshat is that the Mashiach will not be immortal. In the, in the Gemara, it says that he, he will reign, his son will reign, his grandson will reign after him for three generations. So that's the simple, the simple thing. The, uh, the fact that Mashiach is called a miscarriage, a barnafla, that's a, an expression, a symbol of what we refer to in Malkut, in the kingdom aspect of Mashiach, as being his existential state of lowliness. 
But he's not here. What does it mean to be in in in, uh, in Hebrew? Abortion or a miscarriage is called a nephil. Nephil means to fall. There's something about Mashiach that he, he, right he's here. He's always falling. What does it mean? He's falling. He's falling out of the picture. Don't take me seriously. <laughs> I'm just falling away. Then he has to come back in order to fall again. <laughs> so he's always appearing and he's always falling out of the picture. In order, as we said before, to be able to see through him where it's really coming from and who, who is the real king. Shevi Yipot Sadik Vikam. Okay, yes. Okay, so the question is the the part suit for the picture that the Rav painted tonight of Mashiach. So the question is, is that referring to Mashiach ben Yosef or Mashiach ben David or both of them? It's referring to both of them, but uh, in particular, the Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David are the two last as two separate individuals or or a persona, that the loyalty of the Yisod and the devotion of the Yisod that we spoke about, the foundation, the one before the last, that's the property of Mashiach ben Yosef. And the lowliness, the transparency, and also the mirror, and the chain, the, the grace of the Malchut itself, that's the property of Mashiach ben David. I believe there was a question hmm. from this side. No? Okay. Let's take one more. Yes. Uh, or two more. Okay, so the question is, um, it's actually dealt with at least in part in the Gemara, the Ita Hashena. In other words, what do we have to merit to bring Mashiach? Or does Mashiach come in its time? Or is there a possibility, if I understood correctly, that Mashiach himself will actually push the time? He'll He'll make it happen whether we merit it or not. I think that was the question. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the Rebbe said in his last years that the most important thing for us to do in order to promote and to speedily help Mashiach come is to, to think about him, to do exactly what we did this evening, to meditate upon him, to try to find him in ourselves and ourselves in Him, and uh, to be ready and to pray to God that, we, that we, we, we merit. This is the merit. If we merit, we have to pray that we now, that objectively, we're, we merit. We deserve Mashiach. All of the, all of the ends of time have already passed, and now Mashiach should be here, and we just have to desire Him. 
Once more, the opposition to Mashiach, as we said before, is that that serpent or that media that simply does not want him to come. It's very, very simple. That the world at large is not interested in the machine come, coming for whatever reason. So to over that the battle to overcome that and to merit Mashiach come is a very, very desire. That's what the Rebbe said to, to cry out at Mosai, well, how long do we have to wait? And to want with all of our hearts Mashiach. And part of that desire is the ability to, to picture what, what you're asking for. If I pray for something, I have to have some, something in mind, what, I, what I'm praying for. So that's what we try to do tonight in order to give us some meaning to what we're praying for. And if we're praying hard enough, then that, that's what we can do. That's when the shape will come. Okay, one final question. Before the question, though, is, I just want to remind everyone again, the first Sunday of March, March 5th, Zion Adar will be the next class. Okay, so the final question of the evening, and I'll also remind everyone who's here, um, right when we finish, we daven Mariv. Every, everyone's welcome to stay and daven Mariv with us. Uh, the question was in Petak Eliyahu that goes through the different spherot and gives <coughs> um, names or descriptions. It talks about, <coughs> excuse me, the enclosement of the Sirot. And the question was, what does this mean exactly and how does that fit into um, helping us activate the Mashiach in the world and in ourselves? Right. A, a description is, a is a, an enclosement, a clothing. What we did this evening, the meditation this evening, was to um, each different picture of the different Sirot vis-a-vis the Mashiach that was clothing the Sfirot. The, that, the description itself, which was a... Many of the things are, are even new words. Like if we, if for instance, we use for Nets and Hod, we said to be industrious and diligent. So we have many books, just as we said before, Baruch Hashem, Hashem has given their many, many books. And in English also, not a not hundred in English. But there are several books, and each book, the, the model is always the Sfirot. And there are different names. As far as I remember, there are people here that can ask that many of the words that we use today to describe the Mashiach are new words, new in English. The words that we did not use in the past to define and to describe the Sfirot. So using those new words and those new thoughts, those are giving new clothing. From time to time I have to go to your men's store and to buy a new suit. <laughs> so every time we, every class from month to month that we have a new class and we have some new parts of and we use new words, so that's a, that's a, new, a new suit, a new clothing for the Sfirot. I, I just want to say, the Rav and Gali and I believe very much in the 80-20 formula. You've heard about the 80-20 formula? Approximately 80% of the Rav's books are in Hebrew, and approximately 20% are in English. So there's plenty for everyone. <laughs> I should also mention, there's books, there are translations in Russian, Spanish, French, Portuguese. Portuguese. Am I missing something? Chinese. Chinese? Okay. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. Marvel in a few minutes. <laughs>